Whilst our game is pretty well developed now, we still have no way of keeping score. Most of the past exam papers take a reasonably simplistic view at scoring and usually ask for a score to be increased or decreased during collision detection with different actors. Occasionally they get a bit more exciting with it all, adding tens or hundreds to the score but regardless, we need a scoring system and you just need to check what you're changing and by how much. We're going to extend our current game and set it up so that we can show the amount of treasure we collect. Each time we collide with a treasure chest the counter should increment by one. Now we're not actually going to be building this from scratch. Each and every time we've ever seen these questions the exam board has provided an actor class called counter for you. Now there are no guarantees that this will always be the case and actually they often mix the code up inside so it's a good idea to take a look at what you're given before we start working on it. The code here is reasonably straightforward but the concepts are quite difficult to understand. The first line here simply creates the variable total count and sets it to the integer value 0. Now the private part is the interesting bit and the important bit. It means that the value is only accessible from the counter class itself. We can't just access that value from anywhere. So what does that actually mean? Well, if I want to change the value of the counter to add a point to our score, then the other object needs to tell the counter to increase. In our program, it's the pirate that needs to tell the counter to increase the score. Naively, we could do this by telling the variable to increment, sending a plus equals one bit of code, but Object Orientated Programming OOP is designed to block this because we don't want other objects messing with variables that belong to a different object just like you don't let other people touch your stuff because they can't be trusted. Because it's a private variable, the only way the total count can be changed is by code in the counter object itself. This means we'd have to use one of the methods or write a new one. Let's take a look at those methods then. The first is the counter method and it's public, meaning that external objects can use it. We can see that it just sets it up, places the value 0 in a white box with some black text about 20 pixels wide. This is very similar to our first bit of world building code, set it up and put it on the screen. So that's not the method that we're interested in. But what about this bump count method? Well, it looks more promising. It's public, meaning that other objects can use it. It doesn't return anything, that's the void bit. But it does take in an argument of the amount which looks like an integer. The code increments total count by the amount specified in the argument, then updates the counter with the current value on screen. Now that looks like the business. Can you see now why we don't let external objects change our properties willy-nilly? It's because we might have increased the total count variable, but did we know that we also had to update the image on the screen? If we'd not done that second thing, then we could have updated the score all day long and we wouldn't have actually seen it change on the screen. By only allowing the methods of the object to change the properties, we can do other things automatically that the other objects don't need to know about. So now, in our OOP diagram, when the pirate collides with the treasure and we want to increase our score by one, all we need to do is to tell the counter to use its method bump counter with a value of one. We know that behind the scenes this will increment total count and update the score on screen. Success! Now you might be thinking, isn't that a lot of work to update a number on a screen? And yes, it is. But by getting used to the object orientated approach, when you want to go ahead and create much more complex software, you'll have an easier time of it. And as you scale your software, it will be much more consistent and much more secure. Now let's see how we actually do that in code. Right click on the counter actor and select new counter and place it in the world somewhere. Make sure you check your original diagram from the exam question to see where they want it placed. We then need to save the world to make sure that on any compile or reload that the counter will appear automatically. We're now going to pop into the code for our world to make some tweaks. As you can see the counter object has been added to the world right at the bottom. Now fine, this will show it, but it has one major issue. Because the method is creating the counter, its scope is limited. What does that mean? 
Well, scope describes where the variables or objects are active and accessible in the code. Because counter is defined inside of a subroutine, its scope is limited to within that subroutine. In other words, once the prepare method completes, we can't do anything to change the counter object, including changing the score. We need to move that out of the method and into the properties so that it has a scope as wide as the world itself, so that we can actually change the score throughout the game. This is actually quite easy to do. We just move the line of code that creates the counter outside of and before the prepare method is even started. So yes, the last few minutes of explanation have all been just to move one line of code, but it's really important that you know why we had to do that. We had to do it for the counter to be able to have its value changed as the game was played. And this is the problem with so many of the Greenfoot videos, courses and resources on the internet. And the reason why I wanted to make my own. They never tell you why. And if you don't know why, and the exam board changed the question even a little bit, then you're relying on nothing but luck to get you through. Anyway, with this done, our counter has a scope that allows it to be changed as the game runs. But we've now set the counter up as a property. And you know what that means? Yes, it's no longer directly accessible by another object. Ugh! So, we know from OOP that we have to write a method to get the counter for the other object so that it can be manipulated. So, the external object can use the method and the method goes into the property and sends the value back to the external object. Let's build this getCounter method. Make some space just below the line you just moved and before the prepare subroutine. Now in Java we define subroutines, in other words methods, in this way. We start by telling the computer if it's public or private. In our OOP model, an object or class has private properties and both private and public methods. The only ones that can be used by external objects are public methods, so guess what? Yep, we need this to be public. What about the type of object being returned? Well, let's take a look at what type of object our variable counter was. And this is where the naming conventions of the exam board make me a little bit sad and get us all a bit confused. Our variable counter, lowercase c, is a type of object called a counter, capital C. The line we moved was a way of telling the machine to make a new counter, capital C, called counter, lowercase c. Well, that wasn't at all confusing, was it? So, if we want to make our counter accessible to an external object, then we'll need to send the counter. We take the type from this line and simply pop it in as the second part of the method. Now we have the fun part. This is the name of the method and it can be anything you want, but make it something obvious and self-explanatory. We're going to call ours getCounter because it's a method that gets the counter. Simple. Now, the brackets allow us to enter arguments, but we don't need to worry about that for this question, so we'll just leave them empty. Let's get that structure into the code. Great! We've actually done most of the code here. Remember, all we're building is a method to allow an external object to access the counter. So we simply need to send it back from the function call. In Java and in most other programming languages, we do this with a simple return statement. We need to return the variable, and in our code, that's our counter, lowercase c. So that just goes into that statement. Pop it in your method code, and it's done. Compile it to check you haven't made any code errors, and we've finally made a scoring counter that other objects can see and interact with. Phew! Well, that was a lot of work just to make something visible. Our next job is reasonably straightforward. All we need to do now is to use our collision detection code to get the game to increase the score if we collide the treasure. Luckily for us, we've written most of this code already. Go into the code of the object that doesn't disappear during the collision, which in our case is our pirate, and scroll down where you've placed your collision detection code. Okay, so let's think about how this is currently working. The counter is there, but just like when we were working with the collision detection, the pirate doesn't know the counter exists. The pirate moves over the treasure, it disappears, the pop sound happens, and then how can we adjust the code if the actor can't see the counter? So our first job, once again, is to introduce the actor to the counter. 
The code for this is something we've actually written. We made the code to introduce the counter earlier. We called it get counter. All we need to do is use the world variable we set up during the collision detection code, uh, which in our case here is island, lowercase i, that goes into this line of code and we've accessed the method we've created. Make a space in the code before the if statement and tap this in. We'll need a variable name for this counter, but we'll just use the exam board standard of counter, lowercase c, and then set that to be the value of the get counter function. This will introduce the counter to the pirate. And I feel like I'm explaining a lot here, and that's probably true. There's a lot going on. So now we've introduced the actor to the counter. We can use the method from the counter itself to update the score. The actor simply needs to call the method that allows us to adjust the score. If we give it an argument of 1, then it should increase the counter by 1 and then update it on the screen. Way back at the start of the video, we discovered that this was called bump count. Again, it's not always called this, you will need to check. And the way it works is like this. We need the name of the counter variable that we're going to be changing. Well, we just set that up as counter, lowercase c. So let's get that stuck in. Great. So we're saying take that particular counter and use its bump count method. Oh, what about the argument there? What increment do we need? Well, we just want it to increase by one. So the argument is just one. That should move the counter value up by one. What if we wanted to go down by one? Well, we can just send it minus one and it will go down by one. In fact, this method is so flexible that if they wanted us to increase the score by 20 for each treasure chest, we just use the number 20 as the argument of the bump count function. Let's do what we were asked though and take the value of one and place that in the argument. There's our line of code. We just need to include that in our collision code. Just after we've played the pop sound, do make sure that it's in the if statements curly braces though. So, is this working okay? If our pirate calls the functions, as we've said, it should increment the score by one and update that on the screen. Well, let's get it compiled. Great, no problem there. And now run the game to see if it works. While we've got that counter value of zero, let's see if collecting some treasure will help us out. So it disappears, we hear the pop and, yes, the counter has increased. You can try this out by adding a few more treasure chests. But the games you're asked to build will vary wildly. You might have a few treasure chests to collect or, more fun, the treasure chest might respawn somewhere random in the level. We'll look at that in a video or two. Next up though, how to handle multiplayer games.